Okay, so our next speaker is Peng Liu. And as I said, uh, Peng has, has had a long-standing interaction with, with the Center for Siege Functionalization. He was one of the real role models in terms of how we wanted uh, students and postdocs to really interact in a collaborative way and really sort of showed the way for, for us when the center started. And we're delighted how, uh, when he moved to his independent career at the University of Pittsburgh, how well his program has progressed. And we're really looking forward uh, to hearing about his work, Computational Studies of CH Functionalization. Welcome, Peng. Thank uh, you, Kyu. It's uh, a real uh, great honor to uh, speak here. As Hugh mentioned, I've been a long time uh, CCHF uh, alumni. Uh, when I was uh, working with uh, Ken Hawk at UCLA, I definitely benefited a lot from the CCHF. And actually, uh, today, hopefully, I can spend uh, 20 minutes to tell you even our own independent research can still benefit you know, from uh, multiple interactions and impacts you know, uh, resulted from the center activities. And as uh, Hugh mentioned, you know, when I uh, was involved in the center, I uh, was involved in a lot of uh, collaborative uh, projects. And through those collaborations, I uh, got in touch with uh, all these wonderful experimental uh, collaborators. And uh, in fact, some of the collaborations uh, just uh, uh, went on, you know, even after I uh, started my independent career. Uh, so one of the very uh, uh, effective, uh, uh, probably one of the most productive uh, collaborations uh, with my group is with uh, Carrie Ingo group, who was also a, 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 a CCS and alumni now at the uh, uh, Scripps uh, Research Institute in uh, San Diego. So in this particular collaboration, uh, uh, Terry's group uh, discovered this uh, palladium catalyzed Aquino CH activation. Uh, under this uh, oxidative conditions, uh, Carrie discovered you know, the uh, oxidative CH coupling can occur to achieve uh, the effective uh, transformation to one street diene. So we look at this, uh, a problem computationally because this is a mechanistically very interesting problem. This is a rare example where the formation of a six-member palletta cycle is actually favored. And we wanted to know why the formation of the six-member palletta cycle is favored, but the other type of uh, five or seven-member palletta cycle was not formed in this particular type of transformations. So we did some calculations and we uh, uh, look at all the competing CS methylation pathways starting from this uh, pi alkene complex. Uh, so after the palladium binds to the immunoquinoline uh, directing group, you know, this uh, effective uh, coordination of the alkene uh, 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 occurs and that uh, forms a stable uh, palladium alkene complex. So from this complex, we discover compositionally the uh, gamma CH activation uh, to activate the alkeno CH is kinetically the most favorable, uh, even though uh, the uh, beta uh, C uh, Beta CH methylation would, leave, would lead to a thermodynamically more stable uh, five member platelet cycle product. Uh, this process is disfavored. So we can see TS2 is uh, higher in energy than TS1. And then we also try to explain why the six member ring formation is kinetically more favorable. As you can see in the pi alkene complex, this uh, uh, alpha, uh, this. Uh, 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 gamma C is that's being activated is almost uh, uh, oriented uh, in the same plane in the plate cycle. What that means is, you know, this is uh, this particular CH, if you want to activate uh, by the uh, acetate through the CMD mechanism, would require a much less distortion. And of course, you know, the uh, SP2 CH activation is also favored by stronger uh, D2 pi interactions. So. And uh, another impact that we really benefited from the center is uh, actually through the collaborations uh, in other areas where we still see the impact of a CH activation chemistry benefit us to understand other type of acolytic transformations. So we also have a separate program to understand mechanisms of a carbon-carbon bond activation. In this particular collaboration with the Guangbin Dong's group, so he developed this rhodium catalyzed carbon-carbon bond activation of a substituted uh, cyclopentanones. In this particular transformation, the uh, three phenyl cyclopentanone is transformed into alpha tetralone product. So we look at the mechanism for this transformation. So interestingly, even though the initial CC bond activation is thought to be kinetically challenging, but we discovered by the use of a two amino pyridine directing group, 
so the rhodium talus that can actually uh, actively insert into the oxygen position require a roughly low barrier. What that means is that the, since the initial CC bond activation is reversible, so the subsequent the CH activation where the rhodium inserts into the orso CH bond of the uh, uh, phenyl group now becomes the regio and the re, uh, under the read select uh, under uh, the read and the regio selectivity determining transition state. So uh, that really explains the uh, quite unusual regio selectivity for the uh, CC activation. Uh, so as you can see, the more substituted uh, Sorry, the, the, the more sterically hindered carbon carbon bond is actually selectively activated in this process. And that can be explained by the regio selectivity preference for the CH activation step. Because this particular uh, intermediate would lead to the formation of a five member rhoda cycle. Uh, so that's more favorable than cleaving the other uh, CC bond, where it would require the formation of a six member rhoda cycle in the CH activation step. So we actually have a lot of uh, uh, real, real nice uh, collaborations uh, as uh, this one's. Uh, so we, even though a lot of the individual uh, projects are truly exciting and we are learning a lot from these, you know, uh, individual mechanistic, mechanistic studies from the, those collaborations, uh, we are also been wondering since we started the group uh, whether or not we can envision a newer way to have some more effective uh, collaborations. As we all know, you know, the more classical collaboration between an experimental and the computational group usually involves this a linear collaboration where most of the experimental experiment uh, studies were performed and uh, the calculations were uh, carried out as an after fact to explain the experimental results. But we wonder you know, if it's possible to involve calculation in the earlier stage of the project and if the computational insights can actually be used to design the catalyst or to optimize the reaction rather than simply explaining experimental results. So therefore, we uh, proposed this, uh, you know, what we call iterative collaboration model. So the idea is a research project would start from an initial screening and so basically to identify a catalyst that might not give the optimal reactivity and the selectivity, but that's enough for us to perform some mechanistic studies and serve as a starting point of the uh, uh, catalyst optimization. And the actual catalyst optimization is actually performed in this iterative approach where uh, the computation and experimental studies will be performed at once uh, to study one particular catalyst and then we can get a mechanistic understanding to see why this particular catalyst works or doesn't work, and then to provide rational predictions to improve uh, the catalyst uh, systematically. So we initially applied this uh, iterative collaboration model in some non-CH activation uh, uh, projects. So one of the very first projects we applied this iterative uh, uh, catalyst design approach it is through a collaboration with our colleague, uh, Kay Bruman. So Kay's group was interested in developing uh, asymmetric rhodium catalyst to, to achieve this initial selective alinic thousand pound reactions. So in this particular approach, we first performed some computational mechanistic study that identified the redetermining step is the uh, cyclo, uh, oxidative cyclization between the out. A lean and the alkyne OEP to form the five member rhoda cycle intermediate. And then we identified the one key factor that control both the reactivity and the selectivity is the strength of the ligand receptor interaction in this particular transition state. We uh, tested a few ligands, both experimentally and computationally. What we discovered was, you know, if you use this monodentate, monophos type ligand, uh, even though this reaction gave a high reactivity, the initial selectivity is poor. So computationally, we explained that the low initial selectivity is due to the relatively weak interaction between the ligand and the substrate. Uh, but then if you move to the uh, phos uh, phosphonate, uh, a phosphorus bidentate ligand. Uh, so this ligand experimentally give a very low reactivity. So we performed the calculation and we understood that you know, the low reactivity associated with the very tight binding of the ligand was prevented the substrate uh, to bind to the rhodium center in a bidentate fashion to achieve the effective oxidative cyclization. So therefore, we uh, in the next step, we propose that this uh, uh, high Labau ligand shown in the middle, where the uh, phosphor amidite uh, base, the ligand would have a, a CC double bond, where the CC double bond will serve as a relatively weak uh, coordinating group, but will not be sterically encumbered 
to prevent the substrate to bind the catalyst. So in fact, you know, experimentally, it was, it was found that this hemi labile ligand would provide the highest yield and the selectivity for this particular asymmetric transformation. And later on, we applied a similar approach to study the copper hydride catalyst alkene hydroamination in a collaboration with the Buckwold group. Uh, so in this case, the Buckwold group first performed experimental studies and identified the DTBM sagphos. Uh, a ligand was more effective than sacrifice uh, for the uh, reactions with non-activated alkenes. And we performed the computational study and we understood the reason for the rate enhancement was due to the increase of the dispersion interaction between the ligand and the substrate in the rate determining uh, hydrocorporation transition state. And later on, we went through this uh, iterative uh, ligand design approach by working very closely with the Bakul group, where as you can see, we step-by-step -step increased the steric uh, sorry, increase the electrostatic interactions between the ligand and the substrate, as well as dispersion and the, the optimized the, uh, inductive effects, uh, so to eventually achieve a much more uh, effective ligand. As we try to apply this uh, uh, iterative approach to other uh, scenarios, we quickly uh, realized a significant uh, limitation to this approach is, of course, you know, the uh, mechanistic guided design relies on mechanistic studies. Uh, we want to have a very well-defined, uh, very clear understanding of how this reaction works, including what is the exact rate and the selectivity determining step, what's the active catalyst, what's the exact structure of the transition state, and the potentially what's the effect of a co-catalyst additives and solvents. But a potentially more challenging question is, how do we know the substrate or the new catalyst that we propose in this optimization approach would not affect the reaction mechanism? If the reaction would occur through a different mechanism or the rate determining step changes, uh, the prediction would not be fairly, would not be apparently uh, reliable. So what that means is, you know, we, to make this a whole uh, uh, mechanistic guided design approach work, we really have to develop some general understanding of how the reaction works even before we perform uh, uh, those uh, computational and experimental study of the new catalyst system. So the real challenge for that is currently not to study any individual uh, mechanisms for a catalytic reaction. Is that you know, if you want to study a number of the different ligands or substrates in this uh, uh, ligand uh, optimization approach, we probably wouldn't want to study the exact catalytic cycles for every single ligand uh, system that we investigated. So on the other hand, we thought we might want to achieve uh, uh, the mechanistic understanding through a slightly different approach, where we use this what we call an elementary step study. So we focus on the key elementary step that's known to be the rate and the regional selectivity determining for a, a known reaction system. And then we understand, try to understand what uh, deviations from the existing system which cause the mechanism to change. For example, would you know, the use of a different coupling partner or oxidant or a, a additive affect the reaction outcome? So if we can get a general understanding of uh, how these different reaction conditions would affect the reactivity for the, uh, the key elementary step, maybe we can get a more general understanding that will be applied uh, to this mechanistically guided catalyst design. So we applied our approach uh, first to study a series of nickel catalyzed carbon hydrogen uh, bond activation uh, reactions that are first developed by the Chatani School. So since 2013, Chatani's group has reported a series of uh, nickel catalyzed transformations using the uh, uh, amino quinolone type of NN bidentate directing groups. So the reason we were interested in this is because a large variety of the different coupling partners have been used by the Chatani group and other groups in the field. And uh, as you can see, the arrow uh, alkyl halides and the uh, peroxides and bisulfide and even the C bonds in uh, uh, the benzylic system have been used to couple with both sp2 and sp3 carbon hydrogen bonds uh, to achieve the effective transformation. So we wanted to get uh, some general understanding of how these different types of reactions occur and of course we didn't want to do a detailed mechanistic study of every single uh, reaction system. So our approach is as, is as follows. Since the first step of the reaction which is the uh, uh, nickel uh, 
catalyzed uh, methylation to form the nickel metallocycle is pretty well established in the literature. We thought we would just uh, focus on how uh, uh, focus on understanding how the nickel metallocycle intermediate would react with different coupling partners in the subsequent functionalization step. And in this step, uh, the exact mechanism hasn't really been for, uh, hasn't been explored. And in fact, uh, multiple mechanisms have been uh, proposed, including an oxidative addition reductive mination involving a somewhat unusual nickel four intermediate, or, react, or or a number of uh, different radical pathways that typically involve a nickel three species. So we look at this in elementary steps in detail. You know, using a, a number of uh, different uh, coupling partners that's been used in the experiment. Uh, so in this case, we actually see a very uh, diverse reactivity trend in both the oxidative addition and also the radical pathways. As uh, uh, you can see from this uh, table, some of the substrates such as the final iodide or primary alkyl halides, these generally prefer the oxidative addition pathway, but other coupling partners such as peroxide or perfluoroisopropyl iodide would rather occur uh, through the radical pathway. And then we thought we wanted to understand what are the factors that control the relative reactivities of the two different reaction pathways. And then we perform the analysis of the two competing transition states. As you can see in this particular case, using disulfide as an example, in the oxidative addition transition state shown on the left, this type of transition state all occurs through this uh, classical three-centered transition state. So what that means is, you know, these are these type of transition state should be more sensitive to the steric uh, effects uh, uh, compared to the uh, radical dissociation pathway shown on the right. And we also wanted to understand what factors would affect the reactivity of the radical dissociation pathway. In this case, we found a, an interesting correlation with the bond dissociation energy of the coupling partner with the reactivity of the radical dissociation pathway. So what that means is the reactivity of the two competing pathways were actually controlled by two different factors. So uh, if you have a sterically more hindered uh, a substrate with a relatively weak uh, bond, so these type of substrate would prefer the radical dissociation. But if you have a sterically less hindered substrate with a stronger bond, so these type of substrate would would uh, would react with a nickel cycle through the uh, nickel two nickel four oxidative addition mechanism. So getting this a qualitative understanding is very useful, but then we wanted to ask, you know, with this qualitative understanding, how can we make a prediction? Uh, that hopefully we can guide us uh, towards some unexplored uh, uh, territories, both experimentally and computationally. Or in short, you know, how do we translate uh, these mechanistic insights into predictions? Uh, so within the center, I know uh, many of us uh, were uh, pretty much uh, get inspired by the great work of the Sigmund group, where uh, he's really pioneered the use of a simple physical organic uh, chemistry parameters to guide the development of uh, a catalyst system or to understand and predict uh, the reactivity. In this particular example, you know, uh, Matt Sigmund's group collaborated with a Hughes group uh, to study uh, the effects of a site selectivity in the rhodium catalyzed uh, uh, CH bond functionalization reactions. As you can see, only two very simple parameters, the uh, vibrational intensity and the NBO charge was used to establish this, uh, this equation that it can be used to, to predict uh, very accurately the reactivity, uh, the relative site selectivity trend. And we wonder, you know, how the computational insight can be used to, to facilitate uh, this multivariate uh, linear regression approach. So we thought we probably want to uh, uh, do a very careful analysis of the DFT optimized transition state structures, because if we do that, you know, we'll be able to exactly, re you know, review what particular interactions would be responsible for the different a uh, type of uh, uh, reactivity or selectivity trend. And we uh, envisioned that you know, if we can identify one particular uh, descriptor to describe each type of the reactivity uh, factors, maybe we can use those insights to choose the parameter uh, to develop these uh, multivariate uh, equations. Uh, 
So we first applied this approach to study uh, the uh, reactivity of a different type of a CH bonds in DDQ-mediated uh, CH uh, coupling reaction. So this is a collaboration with my colleague Paul Florensic. So his group has developed a lot of experimental systems that involve DDQ-mediated uh, carbon-hydrogen bond with a large variety of uh, different substrates. And we want to, and to see if we can use computations to develop a general reactivity model to describe the reactivity trend of the large variety of the different substrates. As I mentioned, we started uh, the investigation with a computational mechanistic study, and we discovered the, the reaction actually occurs via two competing pathways. Uh, the hydride, uh, the hydrogen of, of the sub substrate is actually transferred to either the oxygen atom or the carbon atom of the DDQ. And uh, we also discovered there is a substantial amount of uh, 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 negative charge transferred associated uh, with the uh, hydrogen, with the hydride transfer. So what that means is that as the reaction proceeds, the DDQ moiety has a, a, a relatively large amount of the negative charge buildup, but the substrate will have a positive charge. So therefore, we observed a substantial amount of electrostatic attraction that stabilizes this hydride transfer transition state. So use this insight, we were able to develop uh, two different uh, factors that uh, would uh, be responsible for the transition state uh, stability which is the uh, carbocation stability, which can be considered as the thermodynamic driving force of the reaction, and also the electrostatic attraction between the DDQ and the substrate. Even though the carbocation stability we know can be described reasonably by the hydride dissociation energy of the substrate, we wanted to understand what fact parameters can be adequately described the electrostatic attraction or the charge transfer in the transition state. So after a few different tries, we were able to discover that the simple oxidation potential of the substrate can be used as an uh, effective parameter that correlates very well with the amount of a charge transfer in the transition state. So therefore, we use the hydride dissociation energy and the oxidative potential as the two parameters to develop this multivariate equation. And in this case, we use the DFT calculated activation energy to train uh, this particular uh, model and uh, we used a few different uh, substrates to validate the results. The results are shown on the right. As you can see, the correlation, even though the correlation is not perfect, but usually the uh, uh, activation energy is uh, predicted using this linear equation uh, would fall in plus minus two kcals uh, of the DFT calculated activation uh, energies. So uh, with that, I just want to uh, summarize you know, some of our uh, approaches, uh, we uh, realized that you know, this, uh, there are already a lot of uh, contributions from uh, the computational chemistry field to understanding the reaction mechanisms of a carbon-hydrogen bond uh, 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 functionalization in general. But we wanted to see you know, if uh, we can be a little bit more creative uh, in terms of uh, uh, collaborating with experimental groups and uh, really facilitate the deeper level interactions between the, the experiment and the theory uh, to get insights that uh, uh, can, be can be really used to uh, predict uh, new chemistry. So with that, I just want to thank my group, and I uh, listed a few students who are involved in the uh, carbon-hydrogen bond uh, activation, and our uh, carbon-hydrogen bond activation chemistry was uh, uh, supported uh, by the NSF, and I'll be very happy to answer any questions. Well, Peng, amazing what you're achieving. I mean, we, we thought very highly of you a few years ago, but uh, you, you've obviously expanded in so many interesting directions. Okay, so we, we have some questions for you. Um, so this is coming from Stanford. From your work with K. Brahman, do the, pho uh, do the phosphoramidates maintain an anti-induction with less electron-rich alleys? Yeah, so that's a good point. Unfortunately, the substrate scope is still relatively limited at this stage. So we haven't really been uh, explored the substrate scope in this case. You know, basically, we just to focus on one particular uh, target substrate. Uh, you know, that appears to work, but we are still working uh, to see how we can extend the substrate uh, scope for this analytic Poisson count reaction. Okay, and then I've got a most serious question for you. Is, yeah. your, is your shirt in the visible spectrum only? 
<laughs> what was that? Don't, don't worry about answering it. There isn't that bossy. It's not my question. I want to tell you. It's someone else's. Yeah. Take no responsibility for the question. Okay. Would it be possible to design a cascade reaction after the CH activation when you are using AQ type directing group? Uh, sorry, uh, Hugh, can you say the question again? And, and this may be, you know, it's more of an experimental question. It may not relate to what you're doing, but the question is, would it be possible to design a cascade reaction after the CH activation when you when using your AQ type directing group? Uh, you mean the nickel uh, chemistry, right? Um, your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, I, I think it might be possible. You know, the, the idea is, uh, uh, especially in the radical uh, pathways, right? So the, uh, if you think about the uh, CH-CH oxidative coupling reaction, this is actually a multi-step reaction. So what's happening uh, in that uh, case is the uh, nickel cycle is actually gonna react with the uh, perfluoro isopropyl aldehyde first. That will generate a nickel three species and then uh, that will release this uh, uh, radical, uh, will attract you know, the uh, C benzylic CH bond to generate the benzylic radical. And then the benzylic radical will be added to the nickel and then will uh, undergo this uh, 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 CC reductive elimination to form the final product. I think other type of uh, uh, stepwise or even cascade reaction sequence might be possible, uh, but um, uh, my understanding is it might be more likely with the radical pathways, if we know how to control. Okay, uh, I have one more question for you. This is coming yeah. from uh, Olivia Bardoin. Uh, do your calculations with nickel, one versus two electron pathway, apply to other first row metals? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think for many of the metals, including iron or uh, even copper, uh, there are definitely uh, uh, this uh, you know, divergence of reactivities where the closed shell versus open shell pathways are possible. You know, we're looking at some of the first row transition metal uh, mechanisms in our group computationally. Okay, excellent. Well, once again, Bang, thank you for a really stimulating talk. Yeah. Okay, thank you again. Thank you.